uh, which has been organized by uh, the center in collaboration with the Middle East Monitor. Now the event is also being live streamed on ISSI's YouTube channel, as well as Memo's Facebook page. Now today's uh, topic of discussion, as we all know, is of immense importance. It is at, you know, as it is based on the rapidly unfolding events taking place in Afghanistan, the effects of which will not only have you know, ramifications for the region, but also international community. Now to discuss these developments at length, as I mentioned, the Center for Afghanistan, Middle East and Africa at the ISSI and the Middle East Monitor have put together a very diverse and distinguished panel of speakers to deliberate on today's issue. Uh, we um, are very lucky to have with us today, Dr. Abdullah Anas, who is the author of To the Mountains, My Life in Jihad from Algeria to Afghanistan. We have with us Mr. Tamim Asi, who is the founder and executive chairman of the Institute of War and Peace Studies, uh, which is based in Kabul. And we have Dr. Adam Weinstein, who is a research fellow at the Quincy Institute. And today I will also be presenting my views uh, on the topic and I will be switching my hats uh, from a moderator to a speaker. So please bear with me. Um, so without further ado, um, I would now like to invite Dr. Daoud Abdullah, who is the director of the Middle East Monitor uh, for his introductory remarks. Dr. Abdullah, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Amina. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to our viewers, participants, wherever you are. And of course, our colleagues at the Center for Afghanistan, Middle East and African Studies. It's always an honor and a pleasure to share with you a platform to discuss uh, pertinent issues that affect uh, peoples across our regions. Uh, we at both centers in Middle East Monitor and the Center for Afghan and Middle Eastern Studies and African Studies have been contemplating this event for several months. However, the fast and intense movement of events in last uh, weeks did not allow us to, to engage uh, with our audiences. And so uh, we could not have found a more opportune moment to, uh, to convene this, this, this event uh, where both Afghanistan and the region, it appears, uh, is at a turning point uh, in, in their histories. I just want to make a few brief remarks or observations on the current situations as it evolves. And to begin, I must say that the, the presence of, of, of foreign troops in Afghaz Afghanistan was always seen as an affront to what it means to be Afghan. Uh, yeah. It was always predictable. You see that for a country that was never colonized, the reaction that we saw as a result of the invasion was predictable. And so we saw the immediate response of the people to protect their, their honor, their homeland, and their values. Because very often we hear you know, in the discourse surrounding Afghanistan that it is a question of values. And very often it is overlooked that the people of Afghanistan themselves had their own values and systems and beliefs, which they adhered to and sought to preserve. Now, one of the significant points I wanted to point out here was that back in 2008, in October 2008, the British journalist Christina Lamb interviewed the commander of the British forces in Afghanistan, uh, Brigadier uh, Mark Carlton Smith. And at that time in October 2008, he said to her that the war in Afghanistan was unwinnable. Hmm. See? Uh, hmm. The reaction, of course, this, 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 this remark from uh, Brigadier Carlton Smith made it onto the front pages of the Sunday Times. And he was castigated and ridiculed by 
the U.S. Secretary of Defense at the time, mm. uh, Robert Gates. He, mm. he described the British general uh, brigadier as being defeatist. Mm. Now, it has turned out that mm. this was a view that was not peculiar to the mm. British commander, but even within the American military institutions or establishment, there was a, a, a recognition that the war was unwinnable. Mm. And it was in 2019 when mm. the Washington Post published the Afghanistan papers, we mm. learned that many in the, in, the, in, the, in the American, in the US military establishment believed, it, it were convinced that the war in Afghanistan was unwinnable. Mm. Nevertheless, you see, it was allowed to con continue over many years, taking mm. a toll on, on lives and, and, and livelihoods in, in Afghanistan in particular, and, and affecting countries in the region. Mm. Uh, not even the, the surge, you see, of, of Barack Obama after 2010, mm. not even that could have stemmed the, the, the destruction and the, the loss of lives. Mm. And so one wonders, you see, that even after the Afghan army created, you know, mobilized a force of some 320,000 uh, uh, conscripts, were they able to, 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 to reverse the, the trend uh, of defeat? Uh, I conclude by making three points here. Uh, concerning this 20-year misadventure, that the invading forces could not motivate young Afghans to fight against their fellow uh, uh, Afghans. And that was one of the reasons, in my view, we saw the, 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 the collapse, the disintegration of those forces uh, recently. But on another level, uh, we ought to recognize now, after this experiment, this misadventure, that uh, the imposition of Western values, the export of Western values and its imposition on another, on another people is really mm -hmm. a fantasy, especially mm -hmm. when those mm -hmm. people you see are, are resistant to uh, mm -hmm. that effort. And Afghanistan is a, a represents a classic case. Mm -hmm. Uh, finally, uh, uh, whatever the origins you see of, of military intervention, whatever its persuasion, whether it is a liberal intervention, as Mr. Blair sought to describe it, you see, these are innately uh, 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 opposed to freedom and independence. Mm. And, and this is what the, the people of Afghanistan uh, sought to preserve. So mm. we had here... A, a, a recipe for resistance and a protracted struggle over two, tech, two decades. We are pleased, you see, at the Middle East Monitor and the Center for Afghan and Middle Eastern Studies and African Studies to share with you, our audience, views from experts on this subject on how it has evolved, on the evolving situation rather in Afghanistan today. So I welcome you all and I trust and, 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 and I'm very hopeful that you would find this uh, discussion today very fruitful and rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, I would now like to invite Ambassador Ezaz Ahmed Chaudhry, who is the Director General Institute of Strategic Studies for his welcome remarks. Ambassador Chaudhry. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Um, um, I, at the outset, would like to join Amina and Dr. Um, Daoud Abdullah in welcoming the panelists and experts, and we are truly uh, keen to listen to them and their views uh, on a topic which is so current and, uh, and, and so uh, urgent. Um, I also like to endorse what Dr. Daoud Abdullah said uh, I think um, uh, no nation would like to be occupied by any other nation. And so the Afghans 
uh, were no exception to this. So nobody wants to be colonized. Nobody likes to be. So therefore, end of occupation is an unexceptionable reality and should be welcomed and endorsed. I know that there's a big debate in the United States why the Biden administration chose a hasty withdrawal and Republicans are all over criticizing them. <clears throat> that I can understand, but regardless of that uh, politics or polemics in the American society, I believe on balance, if Afghanistan is free of occupation, foreign occupation, it should be good. It should be welcomed. And, and we saw that in 11 days of Taliban coming uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to, Talib, to Kabul, uh, no province, no city uh, rebelled against them because they thought that uh, they were being liberated from foreign occupation. Uh, to that sense, I think the decision taken by Biden administration was proper, right? Because America was never there for building nation of Afghanistan. They have to build their own nation in their own way. And they were never there for, uh, uh, their only requirement was uh, to eliminate Al-Qaeda and which had been done as early as uh, 2008, 2009. So even Barack Obama, when he came to power, he also toyed with the idea of withdrawal. And, uh, and therefore, uh, my, my sense is that on balance, it is a positive development. But now, from proceeding from now on, I see three questions, and I hope my, these panelists will address those questions and, and see. First question that comes to my mind is, can the Taliban-led Afghanistan achieve political stability uh, and how? The second question that comes to my mind is, can Taliban-led Afghanistan receive international legitimacy and recognition? And the third question that comes to my mind is, can the Taliban-led Afghanistan remain financially and economically uh, afloat. Uh, these are the three questions, uh, frankly, I am also struggling to answer. Uh, very briefly, on the first question, whether the Taliban-led Afghanistan can achieve political stability, I believe that they can, provided they form an inclusive setup and carry other people along. The uh, second requirement would be uh, that they honor their commitments that they have made to modul modulate their policies and adopt a more moderate outlook uh, uh, that they have already committed. To the second question, can Taliban-led Afghans receive international legis legislation and recognition? I would again point out two factors which will determine whether it can. First is that the Taliban would probably have to recognize that the Western countries in general, United States and Europe are not likely to endorse their government, that they are still on the UN sanctions list and that every effort will be made to make it difficult for them. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, the regional countries are keen to see Afghanistan stabilize quickly. And we can see that Russia, China, Iran, Central Asians, Pakistan, Turkey, they're all keen that Afghanistan should stabilize and would probably be ready to accord recognition and legitimacy to Afghan Taliban-led Afghanistan provided the first conditions of inclusive setup is met up, met. Second factor would, that would be relevant to answer this question would be, if the Taliban would again honor their specific commitment that Afghanistan will not be used uh, by any terrorist group against any neighbor or even neighbor of neighbors. Pakistan is very keen that Af Afghan soil must not be used uh, by TTP and India or any other country. 
uh, so are the Russians and the Chinese are sensitive about ETIM. Uh, uh, I know that <clears throat> Iran is very sensitive about Daesh reappearing in Afghanistan and so on and so forth. So uh, that would be a requirement, counter-terrorism commitments by the Taliban. The third question, uh, can the Afghan Taliban-led Afghanistan remain financially and uh, economically viable uh, sustainable. Mm, there, I would say that the Ashraf Ghani government and the governments before that were heavily dependent on, uh, on the technical and financial assistance coming from the West. Uh, my own sense is that that source will dry up now. The Taliban should neither expect nor realistically will receive any assistance financial assistance from me. So for them to remain financially and economical, economically stable, they would need to depend on the genuine economic activity and interactions with the region. For example, bilateral trade through Pakistan and with Pakistan, bilateral trade through Iran and with, uh, with Iran uh, would be a major source of income for the Taliban government. Chinese uh, uh, would like to invest in this, my sense, uh, in the uh, Afghan uh, economic sector, particularly mineral development and, and some others. Uh, the Central Asians would like to sell their energy, which they have been very keen, to South Asia via Afghanistan. So I do see potential sources of income for uh, Taliban, provided the other two set of conditions that I have met that are indicated to the first two questions are met by the Taliban. So I, on, that, on balance, I see that the Taliban uh, could, could establish an order which could be stable and lasting, provided all these conditions are met, um, some of which they have created for themselves. And uh, it would be, again, a conditions-based uh, future that the Taliban would... Uh, uh, you know, carve out for the future of Afghanistan. Let's see how it goes. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, others' views uh, on this very important question. So thank you very much, Amina, and back to you. Thank you so thank much. You so so uh, then let us begin, I think, uh, the session. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Abdullah Anas. Uh, we will have all the speakers make their um, remarks. Um, I would request all the speakers to limit it to maximum seven minutes, but we could extend it for a few minutes if need be. And then we'll have a question and answer session. So Dr. Abdullah Anas, you have the floor. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, first of all, salamu alaikum, and uh, uh, through you, Mrs. Amina, I would like to thank the, the Center Strategic for this uh, very important uh, meeting uh, regarding talking about the future of Afghanistan and to have uh, this chance to exchange words with these uh, distinguished people experts, people, academic people. Uh, so I don't know from where to start from, uh, from my side. Um, I am from Algeria. I'm living in UK for the last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. But um, always my heart uh, was in Afghanistan. So uh, I lived in this country for 10 years. I fought against the Soviets under leadership of Ahmed Shah Masoud in the north of Afghanistan. I am one of the founders of the Services Bureau, which uh, it, a ch charity was uh, established in Pakistan in, in, Kara, in uh, Peshawar in 84, in order to, uh, to, to organize the non-Afghans uh, fighters inside Afghanistan, which is uh, found by uh, 
by Sheikh Abdullah Azan. He was assassinated in 1989. Uh, um, later on, he became my father-in-law. So uh, Afghanistan means a lot to me. So I'll never forget, even I'm very busy in my country. I am one of the politicians in my country in Algeria. I'm very active. He's in, uh, in, uh, in Britain. I'm running a TV channel, so busy with that. But even that, Afghanistan means a lot to me. Uh, I would just like for in a few minutes, I would like to, to summarize what I hope, what I want for the Afghanistan, for the uh, permanent stability. Uh, Always, I still remember when I watched uh, a week ago, 10 days ago, when the uh, Taliban movement entered the palace of, uh, of uh, Afghani government in Kabul, just I still rem uh, keeping my uh, pictures in the palace of Najibullah, myself sitting in the palace in 1992 when we entered Kabul. Uh, so that part of the happiness, that part of the victory against the foreigners, as uh, your guests mentioned that, Dr. Dawood mentioned that, we share this happiness. But only, as I said in, uh, in details in my book, uh, To the Mountains, I would like just to, 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 uh, to, uh, to take uh, some few minutes from your time to say uh, that the happiness of the victory through the, milita the military victory it's fine, but that is not permanent. The real happiness to take place, the real victory is the political victory. And this is what I'm trying to do. I am still mediating between Panjshir, between some levels of Taliban. Even today, in this moment, we are in touch. So that's why I think the minister, the Mr. Director mentioned three points. Maybe I would like to, uh, to give my opinion regarding the political stability. The first point, uh, Mr. Director of the Center mentioned, uh, very, very good, uh, crucial points he mentioned. The first thing, I think the political, before we go to global and universal recognition for Taliban, or before even to solve the financial um, problems in Afghanistan in the regime of Taliban. Before that, I think they have they, they have to have a political solution inside Afghanistan. And then we have three. I think we have three uh, examples, three experiences during the last 30, 35 years, even 40 years, which is the mentality and the culture of ruling the society, ruling a country just through one political party, one idea, one movement, and there is no chance for the other factions of the society to have their own word. And the, the communists in the 70s, they did the same. When they came to power, Parsham and Khalq, through Hafizullah Amin and Taraki, they completely started destroying the other factions, Islamist, Mullah, ethnics, no just one way to come to join the communists, otherwise you are not allowed to stay alive. And that's what they did. They killed thousands and thousands of uh, uh, the other factions. Same happened in 1996 when Taliban came, entered Kabul, and they ruled Afghanistan from 96 to 2001. Also, they just came to Afghanistan saying, look guys, there is Islamic Emirate, there is Amir al-Mu'minin called Mullah Omar, and no one have a right to say black or white. This uh, freedom of speech, blood, everything based on the decisions of Amir al-Mu'minin. And then we saw that regime collapsed in five years. The same born did the same mistakes after collapse of Taliban in 2001, when they established the, the new government, the uh, democratic government, they said, now it's not anymore, not, not anymore Taliban in Afghanistan. Turban is, is disappeared, beard is gone. No one now can share, only the moment of, uh, 
of the democracy, the women's blah, blah. You know, do you remember the slogans? And no, no more Taliban in this country. And then it was also to isolate, to isolate a group very important in Afghanistan like that. So now we are seeing this movement coming back to the power. So now this moment, are we going to repeat the, fa the failure of ruling just through one idea, one government, one ruler seizing all the power in his hand, or we are here in this moment? So I have to say in one minute, it's a big difference between to call the other factions, to call the other ethnics, to call the other politicians, activists in the country to come to work with you in your government. So if you come, surrender yourself, I will decide to give you the opportunity to be president, minister, or deputy minister, or governor, or ambassador, or whatever, I will put you, put you where I want. And then when I decide to tell you, sit home, don't come back to the office, also, it's my authority. This is one kind of participant. We are sharing, we are participating in the government of someone. And the other one, which is Afghanistan needs now the, 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 the talks and the negotiations, how to shape the, the future, the political system of the future of Afghanistan. That is completely different, which means we have many ways could be Emirati Islamic, why not? Could be Islamic uh, Republic, why not? Islamic State, why not? We are not talking here about the titles of the state. We are talking about the, the happiness of the state, the, the real stability of the society, what, what way we should work to make this country stable. And this is, I think, there is still a chance. I'm very happy. I watched yesterday and continue today watching and do in touch with what is going on in, in Charikar, uh, if, uh, in Charikar in the north of Kabul, between the Taliban and the, the, the former Mujahideen and the, are act, the, the other action, uh, the factions, they are talking in what way they can uh, agree to have uh, agreed polit po political system, how to rule the future of Afghanistan. Not just to say there is one government, there is one movement, it's ruling now, and they are going to call to the other people to come to work as a, um, civil servants for the, re for, for the new regime. I think this is a um, very big uh, difference between this direction and this uh, direction. I hope the, the big brother yeah, for, for Afghanistan, I don't, if I can allow myself to say this, the big brother of Afghanistan is Pakistan. It's not just started from now in the last five years or 10 years. The big brother of Pakistan of, for, for Afghanistan is started in 40 years. Ahmad Shah Masoud told me that the first time when they were defeated by Dawood and they, uh, they, they left to Pakistan during the period of Dhulfiqar uh, Ali Bhutu, and then after that uh, Zia al haq came. So these people are in touch with Afghanistan for the last 40 years. So I think Pakistan, as a big brother, as a neighbor, I think they should facilitate how to, to help for the establishing an uh, 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 um, uh, agreed political system instead of I think just uh, to recognize one political system and call people to work with that political system. Because in my humble experience, the uh, one opinion, one, uh, one system, one idea, one faction cannot rule Afghanistan anymore. This is, uh, thank you so much, maybe if I took long. Not at all, thank you. I think your comments have raised um, a number of questions. Um, I would now um, like to invite uh, Mr. Tamim Asi for his remarks. Tamim, you have the floor. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, It's such a pleasure to be a part of this distinguished panel. Uh, always a pleasure. 
and good to see Ambassador Izaz Chaudhuri, Adam Weinstein, uh, you know, Dr. Abdullah Anas. Uh, we have shared other platforms. I will just right, uh, jump right into it and make a few points um, uh, about the situation. I'm a child of war. I was born during the communist regime. I witnessed the fall of the communists. I witnessed the fall of the Mujahideen. I witnessed the fall of the Taliban. And then I witnessed, of course, this, the fall of this uh, uh, current government. And I was at receiving it uh, as an Afghan. I lost family members in these wars and um, I lost uh, friends and we were displaced and became you know, internally displaced people. I never went out of Afghanistan. I only went out on scholarships and, and studying and all that. And from that lens, I will tell you a few things, things that I've seen in my, my, with my own eyes and experienced it and felt it. First thing is the diversity of Afghanistan. No single group can rule Afghanistan by themselves. I saw the Taliban with their draconian policies in the 1990s. They couldn't rule. Um, and and uh, same with Mujahideen, same with communists. Any monopoly of idea, any monopoly of resources and power grab will not last in Afghanistan. And therefore, inclusivity and broad-based approach is the key. That is one. Second is that Afghan, there is no set of uh, single values for Afghanistan. When people say that the people of Afghanistan is this, or there is this value, or they are you know, freedom seekers and fighters and all that, I've heard this for the last 30 years. People of Afghanistan are also human. They want education. They want health services. They want freedoms. Um, you know, uh, pushing down this narrative that we are warriors, we are fighters, we are uh, seekers, we, we do this and that. I think those narratives are old. Um, People have uh, seen freedom. We are also, you know, we have also been throughout history, the cradle of many civilizations. We were, uh, you know, and, and we could go on and talk about uh, Frederick Starr's book, uh, Silk Road, and, and, you know, other things, how Afghanistan was uh, at the center of many civilizations. It was the Cold War and successive proxy war policies that turned Afghanistan into this new image that we see in the country and around the world, always in fighting with each other. Um, wars are costly businesses. Afghans are a very poor country. And many should, ask their many should ask questions that if there is war in Afghanistan, where is the money, the wherewithal, the resources come from to these different wars? Now, in terms of the questions, um, and, and, and before I jump into that, I remember um, the Mujahideen took over Kabul and within six months, people started rebelling against them because they couldn't deliver services. I remember the Taliban took over Kabul. Inside Kabul, within three months, people in Khair Khana area of Kabul started killing Taliban because of lack of employment, because of resources and because of monopoly. So Taliban, so the Taliban takeover right now is too early to say that it's a military victory. As we are sitting right now, there is fighting going on in three provinces of Afghanistan against the Taliban. Taliban have lost in the past one week, 500 fighters in Andarab of Baglan, around, uh, around Panjshir and in Parwan Kapis area. These are their red units. So my advice to the Taliban is uh, accept the diversity of Afghanistan, start working on governance, start being inclusive. If you want to rule, if you believe that you have won the war, you have to won, win the peace now. And the, the way to win the peace is to form an inclusive, broad-based government. 
both the Taliban and the Mujahideen and others, the technocrats, this, uh, you know, the four generations of Afghans, whether they were the Mujahideen, the communists, uh, the, um, the new government, the Taliban, they are all sons of the soil, with some, of course, foreign fighters within them. But they have to find a way to live together and govern together. Now, the key is uh, how they would come. One week has passed since the Taliban took over Kabul. They still haven't declared their vision of government. There is still infighting between the Haqqani group and the Mullah Brother group over who would, what kind of government they want. One week has passed since Taliban have taken over Kabul. Not a single government has recognized them, including Pakistan. Why is that? If Taliban are such a good creature and freedom-loving movement, which some in the West propagate, well, then ask for that kind of a government inside your own countries too, or go live under them. Yesterday, their spokesperson announced that women should stay at home until further notice. That is 50% of the population of that country. They have asked musicians to change profession. Those are the drivers of an insurgency against the Taliban. That is when things will go wrong, when you start dictating to people how they should live. We are all Muslims, we are all Afghans. 99% of Afghanistan are Muslims. There is mosque in every place. All of us, you know, do the kalima and the five times of prayers. Who has the right to tell somebody you are not Muslim enough than the other? Therefore, if they go for a clerical, you know, dogmatic extremist regime, I can assure you that within four months, within six months, you know, some people are saying there will be a resistance formed against them. And the leader of that resistance is already a guy named Ahmad Masood. And we already see fighting and skirmishes. So the smartest policy for the Taliban to secure international recognition, financial support, as well as um, um, uh, bring stability is first announce their form of government vision. Second, uh, create an inclusive government and bring everybody. Third, don't uh, 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 you know, uh, go after uh, trading off security for freedoms. People of Afghanistan will not accept a clerical regime in the country. Um, no matter what. Yes, they are a part of the establishment. Yes, we are all Muslims. But if they go for that, there will be a fighting. Now, I will tell you what will happen in a frame of six months from now. Right now, Kabul is in a disarray. Taliban don't even have, um, uh, first of all, they, don't, they have not announced their government. They have also not uh, spelled out their vision of government. But there are many groups inside Kabul which nobody knows who is who. Even the Taliban themselves tell me that, we, that it will take us three months to figure out Kabul because there are many groups who have entered Kabul. We don't know who is in charge of where. That's why you see killing. That's why you see beating because even, if, even the Taliban leadership and spokesperson, they announce amnesty, but because they don't have control over it because there are many groups and because there is rivalry between the Haqqani network and as well as the Mullah Brother faction, as well as the Northern Tajik Taliban faction, they have not yet been able, after a week, to tell how they would govern and where is the structure, who is the police chief of Kabul, who is the police chief of this province or that province. They have appointed some nominal people who are heads of their various commissions. Now, if within six months the Taliban don't do four things, which is first, announce form of government, second, start delivering services, third, Find some sort of financial means because we are really going to go for a financial crunch and for an economic downturn. And people who are used to the last 20 years of good life, good paying jobs and everything, if they don't get it, people will start asking for employment services. If they don't get it, they will start resisting. And the fourth thing is, if they don't form an inclusive government and if they don't become more moderate, you will see in six months fighting reemerge, and Afghanistan will plunge into another civil war. And that is what I want to tell them. And finally, that, uh, uh, that I want to uh, say two things. First, the Americans and EU and, uh, and others have frozen, including the World Bank, have frozen their money to Afghanistan. That means no dollars import. 
no um, uh, you know, um, projects will start. And if they go for a non-recognition of the government, of the Taliban government, we will have a huge uh, financial and economic crisis at our hand in Afghanistan, which will, rebel, which will make people rebel against the Taliban. And secondly, Taliban, if, we, if you remember, Taliban collapsed in 20 days when uh, the coalition started, uh, uh, as well as you know, some people from the former Northern Alliance fighting against them. The collapses are always fast in Afghanistan and the fight backs are always hard and long. And I see the Taliban are making the same mistake. They are fooling themselves into thinking that they could, that they have won this war and it's all undone. No, it's just the beginning. If they don't get their act right, they will have another for, another civil war at their hand. Final thing on the foreign policy of Taliban. We all need to reset our relations with Pakistan. I think the last 20 years, what happened was a lot of misinformation, disinformation happened and a lot of uh, mistakes were made by both sides. We need to redefine, reset that relationship. Uh, maybe in the form of a strategic partnership agreement between the two countries to solve their problems. And I have been, in, I, I mean, I talked to your ambassador, Ahmed Mansur Khan and others about this when I was back there and I intend to go back in a month. And Taliban should also rethink their relationship with the West and others. Yes, we were too over dependent, but now we should have some sort of a normal relationship with them because we need their aid, because we need their recognition because the economy is so much dependent on them. Otherwise, we will have lots of problems at our hand. And, and I think it will be just the beginning. So for me, um, the, in terms of Taliban foreign policy, it is first the neighbors, the region, and then the West and the rest. But specifically with Pakistan and Iran, we need to come and do a reset of our relationship and agree on some sort of a relationship that's beneficial uh, to both. Um, finally, as I said, the key is to win the peace now. The war might be over. It depends on how Taliban react. Otherwise, they will have a civil war at their hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamim. Very, very interesting views. Um, I would now like to uh, hand over the floor to Adam for his remarks. Um, first of all, thanks for having me uh, uh, among such a distinguished guest. Um, I'm going to occasionally look at notes. I, I think, you know, in some ways, this panel is a metaphor for the predicament that um, Afghanistan finds itself in. And I don't, that's not a criticism of this panel. This is a great selection of people. But we have an American, several Pakistanis, and we have only one Afghan. And this is a bit of a metaphor for the situation that Afghanistan has found itself in for decades, which is that it it becomes beholden to what outside powers, whether they're regional or the United States, want for Afghanistan. And I, I think we do criticize uh, the Afghan government or different political actors in Afghanistan for not having agency. But there's only so much agency that Afghanistan can have when it finds itself in this in this situation. Um, I also want to talk about um, two goals. I think there's, there's two goals and sometimes they're in conflict. We want to reflect about the last 20 years and in some respects, the last 40 years. But we also want to make sure that we're concentrating on a path forward so that things don't become uh, too abstract. I think from the American perspective, we need to grapple with some of the assumptions we, we have. Permanent occupation was not something that could be sustainable. Everybody on this panel knows that I was a proponent of the withdrawal. Everybody knows that I was a critic of the US role in Afghanistan, or at least the US military role. I think it was an unsustainable model. I don't think that the, a, Taliban, a sweeping Taliban victory is a, sust a sustainable model either. An ideal situation would have been an interim government being formed that was inclusive and perhaps it would have been Taliban dominated. In fact, I think it's unrealistic to think it wouldn't be Taliban dominated, but at least it would be inclusive and there'd be some rule of law and some formal transition rather than 
the just the the unclear situation we see right now, which I think Tamim explained quite well. Um, other assumptions for for you know the last six months, if you were in the United States calling for a withdrawal and saying, "Well, we want to end this war that's lasted twenty years," people said to you, "Well, you're ending the role the war for the United States, but Afghanistan's war will continue." But we see, at least in the short term, that's not true. So American leaders and American analysts need to step back for a moment and consider how many tens of thousands of Afghans have died unnecessarily because we altered the power dynamics on the ground and allowed this war to continue for years. Um, and, and to what end? Because we thought, well, maybe if we continue just a little bit longer, we can either bomb the Taliban into a, a political uh, agreement or we can uh, slowly prop up the ANDSF so that they can hold territory. And we can, we can have a sustainable stalemate where 10,000 Afghan soldiers die a year and, and, and several thousand Afghan civilians die a year. When people talk about maintaining the status quo, that was the status quo. Tens of thousands of Afghans being killed every year. Um, and I don't think it was sustainable for the United States either, because any any amount of U.S. casualties, even if, if it was just a dozen people in furtherance of a military objective that was unachievable, is unacceptable to American voters. Now, maybe folks in Washington, D.C. don't think they're accountable to American voters, but I think President Biden and President Trump understood they are accountable to American voters in a democracy. Foreign policy is not a technocratic exercise that occurs in a vacuum. Um, I think we have to talk about how we understood uh, the war in Afghanistan and, and proxy relationships. Did the Taliban have elements of a proxy relationship with Pakistan at times? Sure. Uh, but look at the Afghan government. Can we say that the Ghani administration doesn't look like a proxy of the United States right now? An administration that folded and crumbled and ran away? Um, over the last six months, it became unacceptable in the United States as an analyst to criticize Af uh, the likes of Ashraf Ghani or Hamdullah Mohib. Well, now that that government does not exist, can we be honest for a moment? We had rotten partners in Kabul, rotten partners. The, the, rate, the corruption, the, the, the strategic incompetence, um, it, it, it's stunning. Uh, the damage that folks like Hamdullah Mohib did in the last several months for their own short-sighted political gains, for their fantasies about entering politics that they did and the Afghans are suffering and then they left on private jets and, and we'll never see them again in Afghanistan or maybe we will because they're shameless and they might come back, but, but uh, you know, in, in the near future, we won't see them again. And these were the American partners and America chose these partners and America chose to invest in these partners. And America chose to prop these partners up over other potential leaders in Afghanistan. And now it's regular Afghans who will suffer as a result of this. So let's be willing to speak honestly for a moment about what the U.S. role in this was and, and the Afghans we chose to let speak for Afghanistan because this was not an organic political process. What was the, what was the, um, the voting rate in the last uh, presidential election? I think it was something like 20%. So can we call this a functioning democracy? And criticizing that is not an endorsement of a Taliban emirate. It's not an endorsement of a Taliban emirate. So we also have to consider, you know, what, what does political stability mean? Um, if it's not inclusive and it doesn't grant people basic rights and it doesn't have, um, it doesn't allow upward economic mobility, that's not a predicament that's gonna stay stable for long. If you look at the Taliban messaging, they focus on security. We're going to bring security for Kabul for the first time in years. There's not uh, casualties in Afghanistan due to the war, sure. But pretty soon there's going to be casualties due to starvation. And that in, in, in itself is a continuation of the conflict of the last 40 years. Um, and of course the international community has an obligation um, to, to, to address that as well. It's going to be an absolute travesty if the approach of the United States or the international community is to sit around and sanction the Taliban so that, you know, U.S. and, and international leaders can go back to their constituents and say, well, look, we took a hard line against the Taliban. We sanctioned them. I mean, 
Of course, the, the only uh, collateral damage is that uh, regular Afghans are starving now, but that's sustainable. So if, if, if that's going to be the attitude of the international community, then that will be a continuation of, of the war of the last 20 years through economic means rather than through military means. So it's absolutely essential that the international community and the United States realize the moment it's in, understand that if we couldn't alter the power dynamics in Afghanistan with 100,000 US troops, we're not going to alter them with sanctions. So I think we don't have to write a blank check to the Taliban. We don't have to endorse or recognize the Taliban government, but we need to come up with a system and it's going to have to include the Taliban to ensure that aid continues to enter Afghanistan, that Afghans don't starve, that basic services continue, and that we create the conditions um, for a, a, a political equilibrium to emerge that is sustainable for Afghans. And it's not gonna happen simply through cross-border trade. Afghanistan is not a country that can sustain itself through cross-border trade. It's a country that's dependent on aid. And the last 20 years of US policy in Afghanistan has only made it more dependent on aid. Um, so we have to recognize that. I think we have to also consider what are the, you know, what are the real priorities for the United States, for Pakistan, for Iran, for Russia, for the international community in Afghanistan. Part of the reason we got to this moment in the first place is nobody wanted to have an accurate accounting of what our priorities were. No matter what um, American leaders or think tankers ever said, Afghanistan was never a priority in US foreign policy. How could it possibly be a priority in US foreign policy? That's not the same as saying Afghanistan is irrelevant or the stability of Afghanistan doesn't matter for the United States. It does. But the United States simply wasn't willing to invest the amount of money and the amount of troops that it would have taken to have even a chance of, of um, achieving a, a, a so-called military victory over the Taliban. No sitting US president could justify that amount of resources. And so what we had was half measures. And that can be seen throughout the history of the last 20 years. Uh, the best example of it is that we entered Afghanistan, let problems fester, and then got distracted by Iraq for a decade. I mean, that's the prime example, but we see examples of it continuing throughout the last 20 years. And that was always going to be the case. When people look back and they say, well, the intervention could have been done differently. What they're really saying is if hindsight, you know, if foresight was 2020 rather than hindsight being 2020, and if at every single juncture we made the precisely correct decision that maybe the intervention could have, could have gone differently. No business person on this earth could sit in a boardroom and tell their investors, well, the company would have been fine if we had just made perfect decisions and eliminated, eliminated human error from the equation. But that is what people who advocate for continuous US intervention expect everyone to believe. It's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous uh, proposition. Um, so in the case of uh, Afghanistan, I think over the last six months, what did we see from the Ghani administration? We saw a lack of ideas. I mean, the sanction Pakistan movement, the only thing that achieved was that it temporarily uh, took the attention off of the failings, uh, the failures of the Ghani administration and created a rally around the flag effect. But it was something that was never going to happen. In fact, I heard that there were folks in Pakistan who were actually worried that the sanction Pakistan movement was going to work. And I was, I was shocked when I heard that. It was such a laughable proposition because it doesn't address core U.S. interests in the region. The United States is not going to sanction Pakistan for support for a group that the U.S. has not even declared a foreign terrorist organization. Now, if we want to nitpick, yes, the Haqqani Network was listed as a foreign terrorist organization, and I think we can say that they're part of the Afghan Taliban, sure. But the United States was unwilling to label the big tent Afghan Taliban movement as a terrorist or organization. So it's certainly not going to sanction a, uh, a country uh, that has, I forget, either the fifth or sixth largest population in the world and has nuclear weapons. It's not going to turn Pakistan into a pariah over support for a group that the United States re itself refuses to label a terrorist organization because it wants to negotiate with it. So this was something that 
the political elite in Kabul knew was impossible. And yet this was this was their idea. Hashtag uh, hashtag um, strategy on Twitter, sanction Pakistan um, and, and other rally around the flag effects that they knew wouldn't work. And it actually became a taboo to, to tell people it wouldn't work. And I, you know, I think that the Afghan government even pressured Afghan civil society and Afghan analysts to toe this line. I don't think in the last several months that Afghan civil society was completely free to talk or to, to criticize the Afghan government. And some of that was because they didn't want to undermine the Ghani administration if the alternative was going to be a Taliban takeover. And I'm sympathetic to that. And I think that's why some Americans wouldn't criticize the Ghani administration. But look at what happens. Now there's a Taliban takeover, the Ghani administration leaves. And now we can all be honest that mo- much of Afghan civil society and, and much of American civil society had a problem with the Ghani administration and saw this as a slow moving train wreck. Um, now, just because I think that the sanctioned Pakistan movement was ridiculous doesn't mean that I endorse what Pakistan's position was towards Afghanistan. If we look at the messaging that has come out from Pakistan towards uh, or about Afghanistan, even over the last couple months, you can see why Pakistan is struggling to have its geoeconomic reset with the United States. There's not even clear messaging. It's incoherent. Folks in the Imran, in Imran Khan administration say one thing, they say different things. They say different things depending on who they're talking to, even though these are all public statements. Um, the military establishment says different things as well. You have moments where um, the, the national security advisor says something that I think is very uh, eloquent and clear, which is that it's not in Pakistan's interest to have a protracted conf- conflict in Afghanistan. It's not in Pakistan's interest to have a Taliban emirate that's not inclusive and that's not sustainable for the same reasons that everyone on this panel has already mentioned, that Afghanistan will just fall back into the cycle of war. But then you also have statements from, from, Imran, from Prime Minister Imran Khan's administration that at times come across as almost gleeful about the events of the last month. And it's important for Pakistan to understand how that is received by the United States. You won't find a bigger critic in the United States of Washington scapegoating of Pakistan than me. I think Washington has used Pakistan as a scapegoat. Washington has not recognized uh, the way the US-led war in Afghanistan has terrorized Pakistanis. I mean, when we talk about the border incident at Salalah, we, 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 we talk about it as if it's just an afterthought. Oh, it's just an afterthought that, that the United States killed dozens of Pakistani soldiers in a strike. Imagine if the positions were reversed. This would be something that would never be forgotten in Washington. Um, So I am sympathetic to the grievances that Pakistan has had over the last 20 years. At the same time, you cannot have a geo-economic reset with the United States or with the world if Afghanistan remains in chaos. Even if it doesn't remain in chaos, if if, the, uh, if regular Afghans essentially become prisoners of a Taliban emirate, okay, they have security, but they don't have any semblance of, of civil liberties or rights. And you take an intellectual class that has developed um, over the last 20 years and you send them back in their homes, 50% of the population, and say, you no longer have a place in public life. As long as that exists, because of Pakistan's links with the Taliban, Pakistan will pay a reputational price. So it is in Pakistan's interest to work with the new Taliban government and convince them to be more inclusive. Do I think that Pakistan has total leverage over over the Taliban? No. The United States was propping up the Ghani administration financially and look how little leverage we had over Ashraf Ghani. So the idea that Pakistan can control the Taliban is equally ridiculous. That being said, it's in the interests of the United States and Pakistan to work together um, to make sure that Afghanistan remains economically sustainable and that the Taliban become at least somewhat more inclusive. And of course, we have to moderate our goals. It's not going to look, it's, Afghanistan is not going to look like the vision that the United States had for it. And in some sense, why should it? It's not the United States. We have to remember that. 
but we can come up with some achievable goals. You know, some red lines for rights for women, some inclusivity of the former, uh, of, of different ethnic and political factions, uh, the, the functioning of commercial airports, freedom of movement inside the country. Um, I know that Afghanistan has, I mean, sorry, Pakistan, some universities have um, created scholarships uh, for, for Afghans. I think it's important that we recognize the sheer number of, of Afghan refugees that Pakistan has received. But I would implore Pakistan not to just view Afghans as refugees, to actually view them as a value add to the society. There's a whole generation of educated Afghans who could come study in Pakistani universities or even work in Pakistan who would add to Pakistani society as your neighbors. And I hope that Pakistan considers them as an asset and not simply a liability uh, to be taken care of. And of course, pa Pakistan has done more than its fair share uh, for Afghan refugees, but Afghanistan is your neighbor. It's not the neighbor of the United States. And so this responsibility will fall on the shoulders of, of, of Pakistan. Um, and I don't want to, to speak for too long Obviously, the United States and Pakistan have shared counterterrorism interests. We see a rise in TTP in, in Pakistan. And regardless of what promises the, the Afghan Taliban provide to the Pakistani government, the reality is they're not able to control all of Afghan territory, just as the United States and the Afghan government could not control all of Afghan territory. For the foreseeable future, the TTP will find safe haven in Afghanistan. And it will um, continue to target the Pakistani state. So it's crucial that the United States and Pakistan continue to work together on counterterrorism. Um, and it's crucial that the United States not simply view a withdrawal from Afghanistan as a way to wipe its hands clean of Afghanistan and Pakistan, because that will come back to haunt the United States. So um, I hope my, my remarks were not too blunt. Uh, that's all I have for now. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, not at all. Um, so I would just like to, you know, add a, a few remarks from my side as well. And um, I will just begin by saying that, you know, um, in my mind, there is no doubt that, you know, when the US announced uh, the withdrawal of their forces and that too, again, in the absence of a negotiated settlement, I think a military slash political takeover by the Taliban was certainly expected. But yes, the manner and the speed at which the group has taken over the country and the tactics that they've used uh, certainly were not anticipated. And I have to say here, nor was the unfortunate but rather unceremonious exit of uh, Ashraf Hani, which is very unfortunate for the people of Afghanistan, as I think we've all um, you know, highlighted here, because it has left the masses extremely angered, uh, confused, and I think more importantly abandoned, not only by its own you know, so-called government, but also by the Americans that did come to liberate Afghanistan. Now, many were foreseeing bloodshed, but so far the so-called transition process has been relatively smooth. Um, I think unlike the past, the Taliban have so far, you know, they've changed their strategy and they have adopted relatively non-offensive uh, tactics. And they have been advising their fighters to follow strict protocols to avoid any sort of conflict. Um, and I think this primarily stems from, I think, the fear that the group might lose uh, the recognition and the legitimacy it so badly needs uh, from the international community, but I think more so from the region. And hence, I think um, an, another important factor has been that there hasn't been wide scale, um, there has been displacement obviously within the country, but the kind of large scale exodus of refugees that I think regional countries were anticipating, that has not happened. And I think this has been reassuring for regional countries. Now, currently, yes, there is a state of you know, uh, concern within the country and there is panic within Kabul. And we've you know, just heard of the attack as well today. Uh, all this happening while the US deadline is set for August 31st. Now, um, at the same time, the Taliban, have been engaging, as we have seen, with different political actors, you know, within Afghanistan. And while there is, as the meme, you know, mentioned, resistance within certain areas, I personally think that by far, 
different political actors within Afghanistan, I think they are ready to work with the Taliban in this inclusive political setup that we keep on hearing about. However, you know, with events unfolding by the hour, it is really too soon to tell what will come of Afghanistan, particularly uh, once the composition and mandate of this future political setup is declared, if at all. Now, yes, there are a number of questions regarding the Taliban, and rightfully so. Uh, has the group changed? Is it just a temporary tactic? Will they revert back to their old ways? You know, of course, the group cannot be absolved of the atrocities it has committed in the past. Uh, but I think the group does need to be given a chance uh, because it has proved that it is a factor that is going to stay in Afghanistan no matter what. Um, and we have seen the group has exhibited certain changes uh, in order to muster up support for their cause um, and to, again, ensure, I think, a legitimate place for themselves in the future polity of Afghanistan. They have adopted new tactics. They've become extremely media savvy and they certainly have learned the art of diplomacy. Uh, before the so-called uh, takeover, we saw the group on a regional tour where they did go to all the regional countries and I think, uh, you know, assured them in one way or another that when they do take over, at least the key border points will continue to function. Now, the Taliban are saying, you know, all the things that we want to hear. The Taliban of today, they're speaking about nationalism, an inclusive government, a constitution for all. They're talking about women's rights. Uh, about not enforcing their views, but rather re-educating and disciplining their fighters in terms of creating civic sense amongst their fighters, duties, rights, etc. Now, again, I say this apparent change, it primarily, I think, stems from the fact that the Taliban realized that while Afghanistan has been at war with itself and somewhat, you know, with the world, it has evolved and there are new actors and players. And therefore, the group can certainly, it cannot operate in isolation. Um, and at the same time, I think there's a realization that the group cannot rule in you know, totality. It has to push for an inclusive uh, you know, sharing uh, setup. Uh, again, as I said, the group cannot be absolved of its previous atrocities, but you know, anything that comes out of their mouth certainly has to be viewed with suspicion. But the fact that they are talking about, you know, an inclusive setup, about nationalism, you know, I think this warrants recognition and the group needs to be given a chance. Um, yes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. One will have to wait and see if the Taliban can deliver. There are ways, there are mechanisms, maybe a regional uh, framework that could push all sides to deliver because it's not just the Taliban. When we talk about human rights and, and the you know, gains Afghanistan has made in the, 20, in the past 20 years, that's debatable. Um, and again, I think it's very important for the group to prove themselves they have a lot on the table. And I think at the same time, it is unfair as well to expect so much from them. This is a transition period at the moment. And I think the group also knows that they're not going to get recognition from any regional country, even Pakistan for that matter, if they declared themselves as, you know, the sole government. All regional countries are on the same page where they've said that they will support an inclusive setup. And I think that is why you are seeing the Taliban engaging with certain political Afghan uh, actors that you know, one wouldn't have thought of in the past. Now, Pakistan's role, I have to touch upon it. And, and you know, uh, as I said, there can be no conversation on Afghanistan without Pakistan. Now, a lot is being said about Pakistan's role. And I think it's not surprising. Pakistan, unfortunately, has been that convenient scapegoat, and I know Adam touched upon this. Now, look, Pakistan's relationship and its association with the Taliban is known. So has its stance. Now, Pakistan might not have been consistent on other issues, but on Afghanistan, it certainly has been consistent. We have always been talking about, you know, a, a peaceful or a political settlement, and that too with the inclusion of the Taliban. And it is unfortunate that it's taken more than 20 years of bloodshed and, you know, thousands or billions of dollars for the international community to realize this. Um, another important factor is that, yes, Pakistan has a relationship, but so do other regional countries with the Taliban. The Taliban have expanded their base and their contacts. They're getting support from a number of actors, and it's not just Pakistan. So it needs to be understood. Having a relationship is one thing, and leverage is another. And I think this is the, you know, um, this is where the mistake lies, where we fail to distinguish between a relationship and leverage. And I think that applies more, I think, to the previous Afghan government and unfortunately 
uh, the Biden administration now too. And I have to say this here, I know my American friends often get upset at this, but the truth is that the day the Americans signed the agreement with the Taliban, again, by excluding Kabul, and then beginning to execute the Doha agreement by announcing their withdrawal without getting key assurances from the Taliban when it came to a ceasefire or even and it, you know, the Doha talks pushing towards uh, a political settlement that emboldened the group. And then we have seen, you know, the group day by day reaching out to different regional countries and, and in essence showing that they have won this war. They did do one thing, and that is that they were, they stopped or they halted attacks against American forces. And when you had statements coming from Secretary Pompeo, saying that, you know, the Afghan Taliban are more, uh, the more, what was it? What did he say? Yes, they are the more responsible stakeholder, you know, in, in comparison to the Afghan government. I think that said a lot about what the Americans were intending to do. Um, now, I think it's important that instead of shifting the responsibility, as we have seen on Pakistan or even on the Afghans, or for that matter, the region, it is time for a collective approach because Afghanistan is a shared responsibility. And this entails, I think there's still time to salvage the situation. We should not talk about an, of a Taliban government. I think it's wrong in principle. We need to speak. This is a transition period for one that needs to be recognized. And number two, all efforts have to be out towards the formation of an inclusive political setup. Also, the international community, as well as regional countries, can, you know, need to continue to provide assistance um, and aid because it's the common man that's suffering instead of talking about sanctions. Because at the end of the day, the Taliban are not going to be affected by sanctions. It's the ordinary Afghan who has already suffered for far too long. Now, lastly, I'll just touch upon, you know, the regional consensus. I think despite you know, previous differences and diverging interests, I actually think the region is fully on board when it comes to Afghanistan. And by the region, I mean uh, immediate neighbors of Afghanistan, that is Pakistan, Iran, Russia, the Central Asians, and a new player in this particular aspect, which is China. Um, I think from day one, uh, well, post 2014, it's been very clear that they envisage, you know, of course, a political settlement, but the recognition of the Taliban as a key stakeholder. They're also talking about this inclusive, political setup, as well as, you know, the fight against drugs, transnational terrorist groups like the ISKP. Um, so there is regional consensus, but I don't think any regional country is willing to step forward and, you know, take the place of the Americans. Nobody would want to do that. A mistake that was, I think, made by the U.S. is that they should have engaged with the regional countries before pushing for this, you know, uh, uncalled for an irresponsible exit that has created a mess. And it's very convenient that the Americans are now putting all the onus on the region, you know, saying that it's a regional issue. Afghanistan is not a regional issue. It never will be. It has the seeds of being a global, global phenomena. And we've seen this time and again. And I think this is a fear that should uh, remain in our hearts. Now, one country, I will just say, because Iran, Pakistan, uh, and Russia, they do have historical baggage in Afghanistan. So while I think they can support uh, you know, a regional consensus. One country that could play the role of a credible interlocker is, I think, China, because it's viewed very positively uh, by all Afghan political factions, including the Afghan Taliban. But again, I think it is important to realize, and I'll end with this point, that it is a collective responsibility. And while, you know, the regional countries can play their role, again, the onus lies on the Americans, since they're the principal signatory of the agreement, they need to ensure that there is some semblance of stability uh, before, I mean, well, the exit is nearly done, but they can still continue the process. And that means having an inclusive political setup. I think that is imperative for the stability of the region and more so for the international community as well. And lastly, the Afghans have to take ownership. It's, it's unfortunate, but Peace can only be achieved if the Afghans, you know, learn to accommodate and, and, you know, compromise with one another. And one is hopeful that if there is a new political setup and it's inclusive, it will be accountable and, and inclusive. So I'll end here. So I'm back now to the role of a moderator. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, there, for those of you who, you know, who haven't sent them on our YouTube page, you can also put them in the chat box. 
Now I will start, uh, and again, these are questions for the entire panel. I will be the moderator, so I will not participate in the question and answer session. But um, let's start with the first question. And I think this is for Dr. Abdullah Anas, who uh, the question for you is, how does the Middle East view the recent developments in, in Afghanistan? Particularly, I think countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and Egypt. And how will the ongoing situation affect these countries, if at all? Um, you know, it's difficult to answer the to, to say this is the, the final uh, answer uh, about the situation there. Because, you know, if you see for the last 30, 40 years, uh, you are asking in a, in a region or in an area where the people are not the same, the government. Uh, because the governments there, which I'm talking any about the region, which is from Egypt to Yemen to uh, maybe the Gulf states in uh, North Africa, uh, especially after the Arab Spring in Syria. So that's why I don't think when you get, when you get an answer or an, uh, uh, um, a feedback from that area, it's not final because the governments are completely isolated uh, from their nations. They are not representing uh, the interest of their nations where you are talking in a, in a, in a region where is, there is no, uh, no election, no freedom of speech, no human rights. It's there uh, protected. Egypt uh, ruled by a general, you know, civil war in, in Yemen, civil war in Iraq. So that's why I'm very sorry. I'm, I cannot say uh, this is the reaction of this state, uh, and this is the final uh, reaction from this state, and this is what we should expect in the in the future from this state. Yes, in, in terms of money, in terms of the work of the intelligence at some levels, yes, still the, the state is in, in their hand. But are they representing the, the national security by the meaning of protecting the nations and the legitimate governments? I doubt it. So I have no concrete answer for this, sorry. Yeah. Would any of the other panelists like to add to this? Yes, the mean. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, and this is informed by my work when I was in the government and traveling and negotiating with some of these states um, and, and, and some of the think tank connections that we have with them through IWPS, uh, if they can, if you can call them think tanks, but that's another story. Um, uh, here's the thing. I think the, the discord between Saudi, UAE, and then Qatar, uh, uh, plus uh, some of the other Gulf states um, played a not a, not a positive role in the Afghan peace process. I think at one point, um, the, the, the UAE and the Saudis were pursuing one policy, whereas Qataris were pursuing another policy um, towards the, uh, what they call the question of Afghan political settlement. But it is, we all see that it's really Qatar, which is uh, at the driving seat, and maybe rightly so, because they are hosting the Taliban political office. They, they have been uh, engaged on this thing for a very long time. Now, that is also one of the things I fear about the sustainability of the, of the Taliban takeover, um, because both the Saudis and, and the Emirates haven't really shown much of an interest um, in their political victory at all, actually. And um, that is why I say that the regional factors will serve either as an accelerator or a decelerator. Um, and, and that window of opportunity for Taliban is running out if they don't form um, a, a a government, and if first, if they don't announce their form of government, and then if they don't, um, uh, uh, you know, form a broad-based inclusive government, because right now there's a lot of hedging, there's a lot of wait and watch attitude by these regional actors. I think the only four countries which are, you know, almost 
sure, uh, regionally speaking, um, um, not sure, but, but you know, they, they have a presence, um, if I could use that word, there's the Pakistan, Russia, China, and Iran in, in Kabul right now, uh, and dealing with the Taliban at some level, even though they haven't recognized them. So I think that you might see that Qatari, um, UAE, Saudi discord, plus other regional um, um, uh, Gulf players play out in the Afghan scene, specifically towards the Taliban, if uh, if if the Taliban do not seize the moment and um, form an inclusive government and start, um, you know, and, and, and recognitions start uh, uh, flowing in. Um, therefore, it's of, of enormous uh, importance for the Taliban uh, to seize that opportunity. But at the same time, I think there has never been a Gulf United front towards Afghanistan. We always knew that. I mean, prior to Qatar uh, uh, being the host of the Taliban political office, it was really the Saudis who were in the driving seat uh, since the Afghan jihad time. But now they have given that seat, um, but they are not happy definitely from what I know, from whatever that has been happening. And um, they could, you know, um, pursue other policies if the Taliban um, do not form an inclusive and broad-based government. Thank you. Um, well, the next question, I think, primarily is, well, it applies to Adam. Um, will Afghanistan continue to, you know, um, navigate the PAC-US relationship? Um, or do you think, you know, the question that we have is that the Americans, you know, it's a repeat of the 80s and, you know, they're going to move towards, while you did say, the sanctioned Pakistan doesn't have a lot of weight, but there are, you know, certain elements within the administration that are pushing for this. So, A, could we see a possible, you know, um, going back to the 80s, could we see, you know, Pakistan actually being sanctioned? And while Pakistan wants to expand um, its relationship with the U.S., I don't think the U.S. is interested. Your views? Yeah, well, thanks for that question. Um... I guess I hope we don't go back to the, the era of the 80s, either with Pakistan or Afghanistan, because, of course, that era helped bring us about to this moment today. Um, and I want to address something you said earlier. It is true that the U.S. Taliban agreement inherently had flaws because what it required the U.S. to do was clear and what it was required the Taliban to do was ambiguous. And obviously it didn't include the Afghan government, but that reflected the nature of two things. One, the way the United States viewed Afghanistan, and two, the military advantage that the Taliban had. And so in some ways, the U.S. Taliban agreement was an agreement not to get shot on the way out, and with a side effect of, well, at least try to work it out with the Afghan government. Now, the United States could have also just withdrawn without any agreement, but I don't think that would have been politically possible um, for the United States. I support the withdrawal. I think whatever we say is irresponsible about the withdrawal, it was more irresponsible to continue a failed policy of 20 years and just keep continuing that. And in terms of the way the U.S. Taliban agreement was executed, I think the Trump administration, and even in some cases, the Biden administration, just like released leverage by having a sequencing that didn't make sense, by not almost giving too many assurances to the Taliban at times and not, to put it like simply, they could have kept the Taliban guessing a little bit more. Instead, they were just releasing the pressure. And I think it's also true what you said, um, that uh, Dr. Khan, that the, the logical conclusion of a US withdrawal was a Taliban takeover. I think the Biden administration knew this. I knew this was a possibility when I advocated for it. I advocated for the withdrawal because I thought it was in the US interests and because I thought the status quo was completely unsustainable and the Taliban were making gains anyway. But it's intellectually dishonest for anyone who advocated for the withdrawal to say that a Taliban takeover was some inconceivable possibility. It was a possibility that anyone who advocated for the withdrawal honestly included in their writing, and I, I included it in my writing. It was a possibility. 
it didn't have to be this way if the Afghan government had been led in a way that gave granted it more legitimacy. Let's never forget that the Taliban did not win because they have legitimacy. They won because a particular administration lacked legitimacy. I don't think the majority of Afghans support the Taliban. They just weren't willing to die for the Ghani administration. And that's understandable. And that's true for the ANDSF, who died by the tens of thousands fighting for the republic, a republic that most Afghans believed in to some extent. But when you see it crumbling around you and you know your leaders have a plan B, how can you possibly have resolve to fight? But it didn't have to be this way. There was nothing magical about the Taliban's military capacity that the ANDSF didn't have. The ANDSF were better trained. The ANDSF had more equipment. The ANDSF had better funding. They lacked leadership. And I don't think the United States could create the conditions for that to happen. There's so many mistakes the United States made. But at some point, some of this ownership falls on Afghan leaders. And I don't mean at the provincial level or at the, even at the military level. I mean the very top. Because there's plenty of Afghans that serve their country with a lot of honor and competence. But at the very top, there were problems that the United States could not change. How does that affect U.S.-Pakistan relationship? Well, because that's what I'm trying to get to, to answer the question. What you say, uh, Amina, is true that there's onus on the United States for the future of Afghanistan. The real politic reality is that the United States already rejected that onus. So if regional countries or Afghans are hoping that the United States is going to place that onus on themselves, please disabuse yourselves of that hope. The United States already rejected that. So it's going to fall on regional powers, whether it should or should not, it's going to fall on regional powers. The, the conundrum that Pakistan finds itself in right now is it did provide support for the, for the Taliban. What you said is also true. The, the Taliban were very good at also getting support from Iran. They had an office in Mashhad. When, when things were tense with the Quetta Shura, they were just, you know, or there, were fact, there was factionalism within the Taliban. One faction was able to get support from Pakistan. The other support faction was able to get support for, from Iran. The Taliban were very good at having a funding model from, from their drug trade that wasn't completely reliant on, on Pakistan. So, and I think the point you made earlier about the fact that a relationship and leverage are two different things is very apt. I do think the leverage that Pakistan has over the Taliban has diminished, but the optics of the leverage that the Pakistan has over the Taliban has not diminished. And so this is something that Pakistan is going to own, whether it likes it or not. Some of that is unfair and some of that is fair because at the end of the day, you know, there were Taliban families and Taliban leaders living in Pakistani territory. That is a, a form of moral support. That is a form of material support that allowed the, Tal the Afghan Taliban to continue a very vigorous fight against the Afghan government and, and feel some, some safety uh, or some security from it. Um, so I think in an ideal world, the United States would be able to look at Pakistan and say, this is in a country that is important in and of itself, regardless of what happens in Afghanistan, Pakistan is important for many reasons, for climate change, for the fact that one of the most likely scenarios where there's a nuclear exchange in our lifetime is between Pakistan and India, and this would be devastating for the world. Um, Pakistan and, and the United States have actually deep cultural ties. I don't know why folks don't talk about that more, but we have deep cultural ties. We have um, a... A, uh, we have a, a legacy that's rooted in the UK. There's deep people to people ties. I live in New York City. <laughs> there, there's Pakistani Americans and folks from Pakistan everywhere. There, there's a deep connection between our two countries. We have an intertwined history. The United States was one of the earliest supporters of the, of the newly formed state of Pakistan. Um, there's a history there and I think we should recognize that. There's, there's a counterterrorism interest that extends beyond Afghanistan. I wish the United States could view Pakistan comprehensively and rather just through the lens of counterterrorism in Afghanistan. Um, it's also going to be important for Pakistan to understand that 
because the CT concerns for Washington are its most important concerns when it comes to Pakistan, it needs, or at least in the short term, it needs to provide some sort of uh, benefit. I mean, what, now, I know Prime Minister Khan has rejected hosting U- US CT assets and for its part, Washington has denied that it ever even asked for such a thing. Who knows what the reality is? Maybe Steve Cole will write a book about it in 15 years and we'll find out. But there needs to be some sort of, um, the, 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 the way Pakistan can have leverage over the relationship is by adding a, a value to it. And the value is CT cooperation. That's the value in the short term. Unfortunately, CT cooperation is the hurdle that we have to jump over in order to address the other things. I think the reputational damage that Pakistan has in the world and among folks in the Biden administration and among the think tank community and among analysts is going to be a hard barrier to overcome. It's essential that Pakistan have a coordinated you know, coordinated stratcoms and a a message that is consistent. Um, I'm not sure that the Pakistani message on Afghanistan or the Taliban has been really consistent. I mean, at times they say they don't want an emirate. At other times, they almost seem to be celebrating events that happen. And it depends on who you're dealing with in the Pakistani government, what message you receive. And at the end of the day, the message that the United States will always listen to is the one that comes from the military establishment. Um, And let's recognize something for a second. The ability of the United States to work directly with the Pakistani security establishment and the Pakistani security establishment has done a lot for the United States in in its fight against counterterrorism. But the ability to work directly um, has benefited the United States in terms of political expediency. Is the United States ready to respect the domestic politics of Pakistan? Is the United States ready to respect the civilian government of Pakistan and its wishes? Or is the United States going to continue to talk about democracy, but whenever it has the opportunity to undermine it and get its way really quickly, instead of going through the democratic process and its relations with other countries, is it going to do that? You know, so some of the responsibility falls on the United States. When the war on terror kicked off in 2001, the United States benefited from the fact that Pakistan was a military dictatorship because Musharraf could simply fire and his generals were acting as his cabinet, essentially, and could just fire anyone who disagreed with him. Um, that's not, you know, imagine if, if at the time there had been a civilian government, could the United States have simply made the same demands it did in 2001 with such ease? No. So the United States itself has conflicting goals when it comes to Pakistan. We want a strong civilian government, but we also want Pakistan to do exactly what we want them to do when it comes to security. These are conflicting goals on the part of the United States. Um, we, we, we praise the security establishment for all it's legitimately done in the fight of, in, against Al Qaeda. And yet um, we, we, we are surprised when they do things that they view are in their short term interest. And they make the calculation that the United States is going to leave, which, by the way, turned out to be right. It was a correct calculation. Anyone with common sense knew the United States was going to leave. And so. Now, I don't think it, I don't think support for the Taliban in the way the the Pakistan in the way Pakistan did it was necessarily good for Pakistan because the TTP are the ideological cousins of the Afghan Taliban, and this is something that's going to haunt Pakistan. Looking forward, if I'm a betting person, the relationship between uh, the United States and Pakistan is not going to transcend Afghanistan in the near future but it should. And those in the US government and the Pakistani government who think it should are going to have to work out the security barrier that we all need to get over, which is US wants counterterrorism assurances. Um, Pakistan doesn't want to do everything that the United States demands. Okay, so let's, let's meet in the middle somehow so we can move on to bigger things. Um, so that, that would be my answer to that question. Thank you. Um, before I bring in Dr. Christian Wagner, I have two questions uh, for Dr. Sorry for the meme. Um, they are number one: How optimistic are you of this, uh, you know, inclusive political setup we keep on hearing about that just seems to be in the air? And the second question is um, regarding the regional role. Do you think there's a regional consensus? Does it exist? And 
um, which country, if at all, would you suggest uh, to play the role of a credible interlocker in the future polity of Afghanistan? Well, as a child of war, I have no um, option but to be optimistic. Um, I lived during the Taliban and I lived during the Mujahideen time. During the Mujahideen time, there was a lot of thuggery. There was a lot of criminality. There, um, we, we welcomed Taliban. Uh, I mean, when I was uh, in Kabul and then we had to flee to Herat, we welcomed Taliban because of the security that they gave, because of the, the uh, various um, you know, policies that they pursued to bring some law and order in the 1990s. But then later on, we noticed that there were foreign fighters in their ranks, that they had this global jihad and other, you know, ideas. Uh, I was at school. They used to come to our school and basically preach caliphate in 1994, um, in 1995, um, uh, up to 1998, when I had to leave Afghanistan to Pakistan. Now, my issue is um, that if the, the tone we see right now is a conciliatory tone, we see um, also that the Taliban are not pursuing uh, some of those draconian um, policies and actions which they used to do in the 1990s. So there are positive signs, I think, and we need to build on that. But what we need to do is actually those of us, the new generation of Afghans, need to help Taliban who have expertise, skills, you know, capabilities, need to help Taliban uh, to formulate, because of that Afghan-led, Afghan ownership, a governance vision for themselves. And we know that it will be a Sharia-based system. We know all the... Um, uh, Islamic aspects of governance, but the actual business of governance needs people, needs human resources, needs skills. And Taliban should not be exclusionary that to exclude the Mujahideen, the new generation, the technocrats, you know, different people that they label, or, you know, Afghanistan has uh, been labeling different categories of people. And they need to make Afghanistan the home of all Afghans. It is too early to say um, whether they will do that, because I think always the barometer for new governments in Afghanistan is six months. You will know within six months what they will happen. I saw that with the communists. I saw that with the Mujahideen. I saw that with the Taliban. And we have to wait for another six months and see how Taliban would pursue their form of governance. But the initial signs are promising. They're talking to Ahmad Massoud, they're, talk, they're you know, respect, res, re, respecting uh, Shiite um, minorities. Uh, I heard that they went to Ashura, uh, you know, ceremony, uh, which was not the case when they actually took over in the 1990s, in mid-1990s. Uh, but what, what should happen is that Af Taliban should make um, Afghanistan as the home of all Afghans. So therefore, this moment as we are sitting right now, it's a double-edged sword. It's both a threat and an opportunity. It's an opportunity for Taliban to form a government and um, an inclusive government, a broad-based government, which represents and reflects the diversity of the new Afghanistan. And, and they could go down in history if they seize this moment as a as, as, as a successful way um, that uh, they won the peace in a way. But it's also a threat. It's a threat because if the extremist elements within the Taliban, plus the foreign fighters which are in their ranks, the TTPs, the IMUs, the ETIMs, um, the Ansarullahs, if they hijack the Taliban mandate like they did in the 1990s, and turn it into a global jihad and caliphate um, ideology, then I'm afraid the resistance will start against them both internally and externally. There will be a pariah state. And eventually I, I, I can tell you right now as the trajectory and the precedence is there, 
uh, that they would um, fall at some point, just like all other governments fell. Uh, one of the gravest mistakes of the last 20 years was the night raids, the house searches in rural Afghanistan, and uh, that, which antagonized many rural Afghans, especially in the Pashtun Belt areas. And I see now Taliban are doing some of that right now in Tajik dominated areas and in northern Afghanistan and in big cities. This is a mistake. This is a historical mistake. They need to learn from history that the moment you do that, just like the Soviets did, just like the Americans did, and just like they themselves did in the 1990s. You antagonize people, you create a base for a resistance, and then a civil war will ensue, and then there will be proxies and sponsors, and eventually you lose the people, and eventually you lose the government. And just like they collapsed in, like this government collapsed in 15 days, and they collapsed in 20, 25 days, there will be another collapse on their way. And uh, for now, they have to focus on that. Now, in terms of optimism, I, I'm optimistic, to be very honest. Um, there is some level of security, uh, there is some level of stability. But as I mentioned, every new government that comes, the Afghan people give them six months. And in six months, then they form up uh, their, um, their ideas uh, or their perception about that government, whether they should resist the government, fight against it or not. In terms of the regional situation, um, I think we need to reset um, our relations with Pakistan. Pakistan should be that interlocutor uh, because of its historical relationship with, Tal with the Taliban. And we need to uh, work with Iran as well. I see that there is a consensus in the region for the first time, post Ghani, that the region wants a stability and security in Afghanistan, and the region wants an inclusive government. And I'm hearing it from all regional actors, including Pakistan. And they should condition that recognition and support and trade and connectivity to formation of an inclusive government and a broad-based government and a government that truly reflects the diversity of Afghanistan. And if I could put it down, it's really, it really boils down to three things. First, the, uh, how, um, first, how would, what, what shape or form of government Taliban would announce? Um, which could respect people's freedoms, diversity, um, as well as, you know, include their ambitions, the ones that they have been fighting for 20 years. I mean, nobody is, is negating them. And as Adam mentioned, they could be the dominant force in that government. Nobody, uh, you know, uh, is going to challenge that. The second thing is the political settlement with Ahmad Massoud and the resistance. Because if they go for a military uh, operation against Ahmad Massoud and the resistance, they will have a civil war at their hand. I mean, it will not be um, limited to Panjshir. You will have many Panjshirs all over Afghanistan, specifically in northern, central, and western Afghanistan. And that will, be, that will mean civil war. So, so far, the signs I have seen, the Charikar negotiations that's happening, Hafiz Mansur is there, uh, Amir Khan Muttaqi is there, and others. It is very promising that Taliban are not fighting, that they're talking. And I think they should talk more and more. They should take their time and, and talk as much as they can. They shouldn't make, they shouldn't make the mistake of a, of, a, of a military operation. And the third thing is cutting off ties with um, international terrorist groups. Um, it, I think it will be unrealistic to expect the Taliban to go over and take on the terrorist groups that are within their ranks because they are connected via social settings, via marriages, via the fact that they have stood by each other for the last 20 years, the bonds in the battlefield. But what Taliban have initially started doing right now is that they're issuing code of conducts for the TTP, for the IMU, for the you know, other groups which are in their ranks. But that is not enough. Um, and and we, I am also, you know, seeing the chatter between, you know, social media and online chatter between various, you know, jihadist groups congratulating the Taliban uh, on their victory, but saying we need to replicate it in other countries. And that is a danger. I am also seeing some data and information that there is an influx of foreign fighters right now in, 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 in Afghanistan, which means that they could rebuild training camps, that they could start 
uh, working for this global jihad cause and agenda, which could mean Afghanistan could again uh, turn into a safe haven and a, and, a, and a platform for various terrorist groups. So a realistic, gradual, verifiable way that the Taliban cut ties and either take over these people, take on them, or uh, expel them from Afghanistan or, 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 or find another way. Otherwise, the entire region and world will face a threat of terrorism. And you could see Fergana Valley being destabilized, the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, you know, Russia, including, I mean, the Chechen and some of the other republics will start fighting, um, uh, thinking that they could replicate the Taliban victory. So therefore, that is really important that on those three conditions, uh, the region, uh, Pakistan being on the lead, um, could uh, force Taliban um, to, uh, in, in exchange for recognition, trade and everything, to uh, turn this moment of chaos into an opportunity and have a lasting impact on the Afghan history. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, Dr. Wagner, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name, uh, let me shortly introduce myself. I'm, my name is Christian Wagner. I'm a senior fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, and I work on South Asia since a couple of years, and I've been to Pakistan, I've been to Afghanistan, um, but I'm following events mostly from a regional perspective. Thanks to um, Director Khan for giving me the opportunity here. I would I have not followed your debate from the beginning, so I apologize if I um, replicate some of the points you have already made. But I would like to take on the point that um, um, Tamin just mentioned, because I think we have a similar debate here in the West at the moment. When you look at the region, I think it's a, there's a certain trade-off um, between the Taliban and all the neighboring countries. Um, a trade-off to get recognition and cooperation vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, security guarantees, as was um, mentioned by um, previous speakers. So my question would be um, how difficult this process will be. It seems to be easy when you look at the landscape of militant groups in Afghanistan. It seems to be the most easiest one for the Taliban to go against the Islamic State. The Islamic State is a traditional enemy or it's a very... Um, uh, yeah, uh, an enemy of the Taliban, and it's also a common threat in all the neighboring countries. So this seems to be, let's say, easy for the Taliban to go against these groups. I wonder uh, what will be the scenario for other groups? I mean, it's very often said, and um, Tamin had just made the point, uh, you have close connections between the Haqqani network and Al-Qaeda. You have uh, other kind of um, relations between the different uh, groups and, uh, and various factions of the Taliban. So I wonder in how far the Taliban will be able to really make a, make a code of conduct or somehow how to um, limit the activities of those groups in order to get this, um, the cooperation and the recognition from the neighboring countries. The second point is um, we, have, we have heard that um, there is a common interest, let's say also by Western countries to focus on security issues, yes. Um, but I think well, it's not very astonishing. Western countries will also put a strong focus in their dealings with the Taliban on human rights issues. So I'm interested to know in how far will human, the, the question of human rights also be an issue for the neighboring states? Or will we see a certain split? Let's say we will have two different circles, one where the Western countries will come up with cooperation with the Taliban only if we get the security guarantees, we get guarantees on human rights and on women, in, uh, women empowerment, women participation in whatever form, okay? Whereas the region could have a, a slightly different setup of demands, focusing mostly on the security issues, but probably less so on human rights issues. So this is just a question, which would then, of course, made it easier for the Taliban to cooperate with the region, or the region could be an easy exit option 
to somehow evade from pressures from Western countries. So I just, I'm just wondering, just want to know what is the, what is the debate in the region is to focus really on security issues or, and I mean, you mentioned inclusive government, yes, but also I think um, this will be a, an interesting point where we may have different views in the Western countries compared to region when it comes to human rights. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wagner. I'll add two more questions and then I'll, you know, ask the panelists to either answer the questions or just give their uh, concluding remarks before um, I ask Ambassador Khalid Mahmood to make his concluding remarks. Um, one question is, uh, this is from, you know, an Afghan student that is here with us at the Institute, that with these evacuations taking place from Afghanistan, is there a brain drain? There, there, there's a sense that all the educated you know, masses within Afghanistan are being taken, you know, back by the West or the Americans. Is there any truth to it, number one? And the second question was, um, can the Taliban be trusted the mean? Uh, I think you've already in some form answered this question, but again, can the Taliban be trusted? Sorry, and there's just one last question that I, uh, what is the time frame? that can be given by the international community to the Taliban. Uh, there is a small window of opportunity, but you know, what is the time frame until action is taken against uh, you know, the Taliban, whether it's sanctions or, or whatnot? So these are the questions that I pose again to all the three participants and quick answers because we are running out of time. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Adam and then Tamim and then with Dr. Abdullah. Um. I think Tamim and others are, are more qualified to answer the first question. Uh, in terms of time frame, in terms of how to deal with the Taliban, um, I think we're in a critical time frame. They're meeting with Karzai, they're meeting with Abdullah Abdullah. Are these meetings just photo opportunities or are these meetings the beginning of an inclusive process? It is critical that Pakistan and the international community send a message with each other and, and i also agreed with by the way i also agreed with you amina on the fact that it would have been better if the united states had built a regional consensus before engaging with the taliban and doha but that didn't happen well now is an opportunity to learn from that and have a regional voice that there has to be an inclusive government um not just for the sake of rights not just for the sake of democracy but for the sake of of uh, us avoiding what Tamim weren't warned about, which is that we just fall back into the cycle of war. If there's an inclusive government that, you know, allows for some dissent, even if it's, even if it's Taliban led, you know, that will mitigate the chances of, of um, us falling back into war. But the time is now, if the Taliban think they can just get away with photo ops, then that's what they're going to do. It's a maximalist movement. It's going to, take as much power as I think it, 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 it can get, but, but it is a pragmatic movement at some level. And so we need to deliver the message that the pragmatic choice is to be inclusive. And I think the timeline for that is measured in a couple months. A couple of months, six months, as the meme keeps on saying, that's the barometer. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I don't even feel qualified to throw out timelines anymore because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our predictions are often so incorrect, but we're certainly yeah. not talking about more than six months. Mm. Okay. All right. The meme? Yeah, just quickly to answer. Yes, definitely. There is brain drain and we, uh, some of the best and the brightest will come uh, are, are leaving. But they will come back if the Taliban form a open, inclusive and, um, you know, free Afghanistan. So... I think it is uh, it is an opportunity too. Um, many of these people could come back. Uh, they could sit in remittances. But yes, the best and the brightest are leaving uh, Afghanistan. In terms of trusting the Taliban, um, it, it really depends on, yes, we can trust the Taliban, but it really depends on three factors. First is how much, first is this transition from a militancy to a government. Uh, Taliban are no more uh, an insurgency. Um, it's easy to fight. It's difficult to govern. Um, so they have a task at their hand, which they are not used to do. So the first thing is um, 
their governance style. Second is the political settlement question. And third is the conduct of foreign relations. Um, and, and finally, I also think that the previous government followed a very antagonistic and confrontational policy with our neighbors. We have to go for a zero policy, um, zero problems policy with our neighbors. Iran, Pakistan are keys um, uh, to, to Afghan problem and um, we have to work with them. We all made mistakes and I hope that people have learned from those mistakes on both sides and reset the relationship with, uh, with the region, specifically with our neighbors. Um, and we have to, and, and Taliban should use this opportunity and reset the relationship with the neighbors um, and learn from those mistakes that Ashraf Ghani and, and others um, you know, made in terms of the conduct of its foreign policy. In terms of time frame, look, I don't have a magic wand or a, or a crystal ball, but I am telling you my experience um, that I lived uh, in, in the, in the mm. Mujahideen time and in the Taliban time. It was always six months uh, or even less. All right, thank you. Dr. Abdullah, would you like to add to the remarks or, or maybe concluding remarks before we I could say some words regarding the, um, if, whether we are optimistic of uh, the future of Taliban and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm or not, let me say it clearly. If, if, if we compare the, the behavior of Taliban when they seized the power in 1996, to, uh, to compare it with uh, 21 now when they entered Kabul, I think they, they sent some positive signs. They killed Najibullah the first day they came in Kabul. Uh, they were, for example, uh, dealing with the Shia and the Hazara in a very unfair way, which is not taking place this time. Uh, we are still seeing some uh, political opponents to Taliban still living in Kabul, like Hikmatyar, Karzai, Abdullah Abdullah. So this is clear. If you compare this behavior to 96 behavior, I can say positive, Yanis. It's good, it's going in the right, right direction. But the question, is this final? And these questions I heard that you know, many people asking these questions, is this permanently or just uh, temporary? Uh, so this is uh, all what can I say? The future, I don't know what the future is hiding for Afghanistan. I hope con the Taliban continue like that till they achieve the inclusive uh, government. That. Thank you. Okay, so um, before we conclude, I'd like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, who's always very patient as the chairman, listens to everybody. So I think it's fair to give him the concluding remarks. Ambassador Khalid Mahmood. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, we indeed had a very thought-provoking exchange on uh, the evolving situation in Afghanistan. And we have heard uh, people who have great knowledge, hands-on experience, and also scholarly credentials to speak on this subject. So as we see now, the America's longest 20 years war is coming to an end but at a great human and material loss and destruction. The war could have been wound up much earlier. For example, after the Taliban, which were aligned with Al-Qaeda at that time, were ousted, and the threat of terrorism was neutralized, which was the original objective of US NATO military intervention at that time. Even some other opportunities of involving mutual compromise between the US backed government and uh, the Taliban were frittered away. So while eventually US took too long a time to decide to withdraw, but when it did so, it withdrew post haste. 
without firming up transitional political, military, logistical arrangements or original consensus. And following the Doha agreement, which protected US core interests, the intra-Afghan peace process also did not culminate in any timely fashion. And, and I think the new government tainted and weakened by rampant corruption procrastinated. But in the event US proceeded unilaterally without taking the different stakeholders into confidence. So what we see now resultant chaos and blame game, particularly targeting Pakistan. So in this situation, we have rightly focused our attention as to what went wrong, whose responsibility, what lies in the future. I think one thing is certain that indeed Afghanistan is a graveyard of empires. And uh, I think American power also had to face the same fate as befell to the earlier powers which tried to dominate this region. So, but has America really withdrawn from this region? I don't think so. US remains a preeminent power though its influence may have been dented. And we cannot expect that US would leave this region and there are many strategic and economic reasons for that, what I'm saying. At least to keep an eye on China, Russia, Central Asia, mineral resources, Pakistan, its nuclear assets and so on. So I think what needs to be done is that we have to show sensitivity to the local culture, not try to impose a system uh, which is alien to the local culture. For example, Jirga system has to be given preference over other systems. And I think we have to avoid big power confrontation syndrome. I'm referring to US perceived, uh, uh, you know, hostility towards China and Russia. Rather, we have to go for big power, healthy competition and cooperation, geoeconomics and connectivity rather than military alliances. And in this respect, China's BRI and CPEC initiatives, and even US Build Back Better World Initiative is the answer, the right approach. And we have to also emphasize unilateralism. Uh, no, sorry. Instead of unilateralism, we have to emphasize multilateralism and regionalism, which was promised by candidate President Biden. And I think when the West and the United States you know, talk of uh, the necessity of Taliban respecting human rights, of course, it's a very legitimate demand, but to have credibility, one has to uh, be not adopt double standards. You know. What credibility this demand has on Taliban or on China regarding Xinjiang 
Hong Kong. Uh, if the West, United States, remains mum of what's happening in occupied Kashmir under Indian occupation, or what's happening to the Palestinians uh, under Israeli occupation. So I think to have credibility, there has to be no double standards. But these were the general comments, but I think one has to focus now also on the immediate requirements. Uh, that is uh, it's due blame game, and instead focused on reconstruction and rehabilitation and development needs of Afghanistan. Because that will be the most effective check against terrorism, extremism, and militancy raising it, their heads again. Freezing of their assets is not the right approach as has been done by the United States and uh, uh, Bretton Woods uh, institutions. Secondly, I think safe evacuation arrangements have to be put in place. Now, as we see, there are two Kabuls, the city and the airport. And thirdly, planning arrangements have to be made to look after any flow of refugees and IDPs in Afghanistan. But I think equal responsibility lies on the Taliban government. It has been rightly pointed out that if Taliban, if Taliban's necessity to have international legitimacy and continued flow of, flow of financial assistance. The Taliban should know that the international legitimacy will not be given to them. They will have to earn it. Of course, they have given assurances that they will respect the rights of women and girls, observe humanitarian law. They will not allow the abuse of a foreign parity against any third country, will not permit safe heavens for any terrorist outfits. But then the Taliban have what they say, walk their talk. Given Afghanistan's racial, tribal, geographical diversity, establishment of a broad-based inclusive government is imperative. I think that is the consensus which I feel which has emerged from this discussion. And I really, it has been very informative and instructive interaction. And I thank Amna Khan, your center, for organizing this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of today's um, seminar, which really has been, you know, uh, fascinating. Um, one hopes that peace and stability does return to Afghanistan for all of our sake. Now, uh, this leaves me just to thank our panelists. Um, I'm very grateful to Dr. Abdullah Anas for joining us, uh, for Mr. Tamim Asi, and also Adam, because I believe if you're, in, you're joining us from Washington, am I correct in that? No, I'm actually in New, York City. in New York City. Okay, well, it's still, I don't know how the time difference is, but thank you for adjusting your time differences and, and you know, joining us today. I'd also like to, again, um, thank the Middle East Monitor as well, because this was a joint, um, you know, webinar organized with them. We will continue to, you know, um, look at the situation in Afghanistan. Obviously, it's evolving, and we hope to engage with the three panelists again as well. So thank you once again, and uh, it's good afternoon from here, and I think it's lunchtime.